Welcome to the Real Life Resilience Podcast. Stories of recovery from life's most difficult trauma with Stacy Brookman. There are these people I always get a kick out of them. They get home and they've had a long day and they say, you know, I'm going to order a pizza. And it comes and they have like two slices and they put the rest in the fridge for like later. They call this leftover pizza. I'm 45 years old. Not once in my life have I ever had leftover pizza. That's not a, that's, a, like, that's like a unicorn. That's a mythical creature to me. Leftover pizza does not exist. If I order a pizza, I have the pizza. Hey guys, this is Stacy Brookman, and I'm glad you're listening to Real Life Resilience, the only podcast that connects you with the world's best resources for becoming a resilient person. If you have ADHD or know someone who does, you're going to love our guest today. Peter Shankman has bought and sold multi-million dollar businesses and runs the Shank Minds Mastermind. He believes that the ADHD mind is a Lamborghini. You just have to know how to drive it correctly. Find out why he feels he has the gift of ADHD. But before we discover more, let me share something with you that might change your life. You've always been a strong person, stronger than you realize actually. But sometimes, thinking about the past unearths emotions and memories that are painful. Let us take you step by step through discovering your life story and the wisdom and healing power that it holds. Register now for Stacy's next free webinar where she reveals the four simple, proven methods to writing the first chapter of your life story this week. Simply click on the link in the show notes or head to stacybrookman.com slash webinar. I love to hear from listeners personally and I answer my own emails. So drop me a line and let me know what you found interesting in this episode or to ask me a question. My email is stacy at stacybrookman.com. Now let's welcome author of Faster Than Normal, Peter Shankman. Well, Peter, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your sharing your expertise. My pleasure. Great to see you. And you came by your expertise quite hard in this case with the ADHD, and you grew up with ADHD, correct? I did, but when I was a kid in the 80s, it wasn't called ADHD. It was called sit down, you're disrupting the class disease. <laughs> and that's what, one of the things I was going to ask you about. What are some of the lowest points in your life related to ADHD? What are some tough parts? I just remember always asking myself, you know, why aren't I like everyone else? Why can't I focus? Why, why am I always trying to make jokes? Why, am I always, why do I always need to be the center of attention? You know, didn't realize back then it was because my brain was looking for that extra dopamine that it doesn't get. Yeah, and now you're a very successful business person. And ADHD is your superpower, correct? I've gotten lucky. You know, for me, it's really about being able to use my ADHD to my advantage to be able to uh, channel that energy, figuring out ways to get that energy and then channel it to do sort of what I need to do. So yeah, I've been fortunate. Okay. Well, paint me the picture of what you're doing now. And you, you've got the book out, Faster Than Normal, and you have a website called fasterthannormal.com. Tell me about your successes, that how you've not how just yet, but what you've overcome and what you're doing right now to be successful. So Faster Than Normal is a uh, new book um, focusing on the ADHD brain and the concept that it actually is a benefit, not a curse to have it. It's also designed for people without ADHD to sort of follow the rules that we have and get a uh, uh, really good uh, few hours uh, a day of productivity back in your life. So I built that I wrote the book because I launched a podcast several months or two, no, about two years ago now called Fast and the Normal. And the premise was, I wonder if there are other people who attribute their ADHD to their benefit, you know, to their, to their success. Sure enough, there were. And so I have a pretty large following on that podcast, about 20, 30,000 downloads a month. I'm sorry, a week. So yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to change the conversation around that. You know, that comes after years of working as a corporate public speaker and running and selling three successful companies, including Help a Reporter Out. Really just, uh, you know, like I said, I'm very, very fortunate. I'm having a really great time. I'm very lucky. And where was, when was that aha moment when you said, gosh, I wonder if other people have this situation and, you know, how I can help them, that you said, I, I want to make sure, I want to make this public, that, there, that ADHD can be a superpower. What was that moment? You know what it is? I think that moment came when I just realized, I remember one day I just decided that I no longer to the people who are out there, you know, if they were going to judge me, if they're going to do whatever, those people are not helping me pay my mortgage. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that being said, why should I, for lack of a better word, give a damn about what they think of me or what they're going to say? I'm just going to go out and tell my story. Right. And it affected you as a child in school. And tell me a little bit more about how it affected you as an adult. Well, 
it was sort of the same thing. You know, I had a very, uh, was very socially awkward as a kid mm-hmm. I had, and, and into adulthood. You know, it wasn't until my, my early 30s that I really learned how to sort of control this, I guess, this ADHD, this, this faster brain. Um, and learned how to use it to my advantage. And so because of that, growing up was tough because, you know, uh, same thing as, as, as an adult, I was always, you know, I only had one real job in my life, right? I was only able to hold one real job. Everything else was, I've been working as an entrepreneur since 1998, since my early 20s. And it was really about, um, you know, I just I fit in better as an entrepreneur. And mm. I couldn't imagine going to an office every day and having a real job. It's very strange. <laughs> so how, how did you wrestle with ADHD? And do you still wrestle with it? I think I do every day. You know, for me, it's really about making sure that I have um, very specific, what I call, I call them life rules. So very specific things I do and don't do to make sure that I'm, I'm doing the best I possibly can to treat my brain the best way. An example of that would be, you know, um, I get up very, very early every day because it is an absolute requirement that I work out every morning. An absolute requirement. If I don't work out... I don't have a good day. Essentially, if I don't work out, bad things happen. Not bad things happen, but I just, I'm not anywhere near my best, right? Right, right. You know, and I want to be at my best. So I'm constantly, so, and then, you know, sometimes that means I'm up at 3.30, quarter four in the morning to work out. And, you know, people think I'm insane. Remember the <laughs> best quote, of, you're up at 3.45, what are you, a farmer? You know? <laughs> but if that's the only time I have, then that's what I have to do. And it gets to the point where you understand that and you accept it. Right. So I don't mind that anymore because I know that the days I don't work out, I'm not as productive. I'm not as happy. I'm not as whatever. And so, you know, you, you, you accept these life rules and how mandatory they are. Um, you know, I don't drink anymore because I never, uh, you know, sought out to get drunk or whatever, but I didn't start drinking until my thirties when I had my first PR agency. And it was, I, I realized, wow, I really like alcohol. And like everything else you do when you're, when you're 88, you're faster than normal. We have two speeds and only two speeds. Our two speeds are uh, namaste and I'll cut a bitch. <laughs> and, you know, there, there, is no, there is no middle ground there, right? So, right. you know, I don't have one drink. I have six drinks. Um, I don't, uh, you know, you have these people who, there are these people I always get a kick out of them. They, they, they get home and they've had a long day and they say, you know, I'm going to order a pizza. And they order a pizza and it comes and they have like two slices and they put the rest in the fridge for like later. Mm-hmm. They call this leftover pizza. So, I'm 45 years old. Not once in my life have I ever had leftover. That's not a. That's a, like a, that's like a unicorn. That's a mythical creature to me. <laughs> leftover pizza does not exist, right? Mm-hmm. If I order a pizza, I have the pizza. And so, understanding that, the same premise exists for alcohol. Um, I would assume it exists for gambling. You know, so I'm just I'm very aware of myself. I'm very aware of the things that trigger me and I go out of my way to avoid them. There's a great, it's a great quote from uh, the movie war games. The only winning move is not to play. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't play as you know, um, am I perfect at it? No, but I certainly try my best to not have those issues. And I think you mentioned in your book that uh, ADHD and addiction are not that far apart. Oh, they're, ve- they're very close on the scale. No question right. about it. You know, especially you know, when you're ADHD, you're, you're moving fast. You're constantly trying to do quick things, the whole thing. You know, why would you, why would you uh, not want to, there's a great quote in the West Wing, uh, who's the, uh, I'm talking about his name now, the chief of staff, uh, who, who was an alcoholic in real life and also portrayed one on the show. He says, um, I never understood people who, who leave wine in their glass or only have one drink. How, how, why wouldn't you want that feeling to continue forever? <laughs> it's the same thing when you have ADHD. You get these incredibly high highs and incredibly low lows. And when you're incredibly in these high highs, you can work forever. You can, oh, it's a kick-ass feeling. I, I, I can come down from a skydive and I can, I'm so full of dopamine, I can work for 12 hours nonstop. Mm-hmm. Problem is, though, um, you just need to be aware of how your brain works in that regard. Right. Now, and the book also, though, is very fascinating. I, I got it on audiobook so I can listen to it, and I absolutely love it. But writing a book can sometimes be tedious, right? So how in the world did you get the book written? I booked a flight from New York City to Tokyo. I boarded the plane at 1030, armed with my laptop, um, a power cord, my headphones, and a sweater. I wrote chapters one through five in the flight to Tokyo. I landed in Tokyo. I landed in Tokyo. I went through immigration. 
I came back. I went to immigration. I went out, outside of the airport. I took a deep breath of fresh air in, in Tokyo. I walked back into the airport, went back through immigration, um, went to the lounge, had a cup of coffee, walked onto the same plane, same seat, wrote chapter six through 10 on the flight home. <laughs> oh my landed, gosh. Landed 31 hours after I took off with a bestseller. And that is the only way I know how to work. And people think it's crazy, but it works. It's not crazy if it works for you. Wow. Okay. So what's your next, what are you going to do on your next flight to Tokyo? Well, literally that's what I do on my planes. I write because that's, that's my, I call it a zone of focus and that is where mm -hmm. my zone of focus is. And so that's how I get things done. And people think, oh my God, you're crazy. You, you spent $5,000 to, to go nowhere. I'm like, no, I spent $5,000 to write a best-selling book. Right. Right. You can spend that on a, on a book coach. Exactly. And a year. <laughs> and that was the thing that you were like, oh, you have, you have the, the, I remember the, the, Publishers, don't you worry if you just write a page a day. You're not like, do you have any idea who I am? That's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, with two weeks left, I hadn't written anything. Mm -hmm. She's like, um, so how's it going? I'm like, oh, it's great. <laughs> and, yeah, came home and wrote a, you know, had a book. I'm like, here you go. She's like, oh, you must have worked on it for a while. I'm like, yeah, about 30 hours. <laughs> now, so a lot of people label ADHD as negative, right? And, and a lot of people like label some things as bad today that could be a positive in the future. You've made ADHD a positive thing. So help us think about what labels do to people and, and how, what they did to you and, and how you've turned that around. Well, I didn't get to, again, I didn't get diagnosed until my, my late thirties. And so for me, the, the label wasn't so much you have ADHD. The label was um, you're disrupted. Mm -hmm. You're disrupting influence on those around you. So, you know, so for me, I just thought I was bad, right? I, I, I didn't behave. And it's only now that I realized what it was and how I could improve. And, and so the problem with labels is that the second you say, oh, this kid's ADHD, you know, you immediately, um, you're, you're, what you're saying is you're different. And if you're different, that's wrong. Right. Right. And that's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me is not, acceptable. I don't like, you know, I've been different all my life. And so for you to say that different, if you're different, that's wrong. I have a severe problem with that. And mm -hmm. so for me, I like to know that I can be, I can be, um, different and use that to my advantage. Right. And that is the, um, that is the goal to, for me to have this, this sort of, um, uh, that I can teach people that, it's not a death sentence to be different. There's nothing wrong with being different. And it actually is, can be very beneficial. It's, you want to be different. Mm -hmm. For p those people listening who have ADHD or suspect they have or are just, you know, disruptive themselves or people like me who just want to get more hours in the day or be more productive, what are some of the tips that you give in your book? Well, I mean, the, the key is, you know, again, you have to understand your... Um, you have to understand your brain and you have to understand how your brain works, right? And if your brain, you, it's the oxygen mask theory. If you can't take care of yourself, then you can't take care of anyone else. And so you have to be at your best long before uh, you're able to help other people. So for me, I understand that. And I know how my brain works um, and how things done. And so, I'm fine with that. And I'm fine with understanding that I am different because it's my differences that have given me my most, the most success I've had in my life. So ha have there been people that helped you along the way discover some of those, those things that you do? Like, it sounds like you do some, you know, promises to yourself, like I'm going to get up every day. Um, who helped you discover some of those things that you need to do to, for your brain? I, I, it was entirely self-learned. You know, I, okay. over time, I realized that I was being drawn to do, doing certain things that I enjoyed. I would assume the same reason some people are drawn to illegal drugs or, 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 or crime or drag racing or whatever. You know, you, 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 you get this rush. You get something that you don't have. Mm -hmm. And I'm very fortunate, you know, that my upbringing, I was drawn to good things. And do you think that was shaped in any way by the, your friends or family or... I, I have no doubt. I mean, I had, I had yeah. great parents who were, who were there for me and who cared um, and were very supportive of, of, of my strangeness, as it were. Now, let me ask you this. Was there a point in time when you used ADHD as an excuse or just Never. your behavior? Nope. 
Never. Okay. Never did. My That's goal right. was to my goal was to fix the problem. Um, I wanted to make sure that, um, yeah, I wanted to make sure that I was uh, always that I always had the ability to you know, be responsible for my own actions. I've never once said, oh, that's my ADHD. I, I, I refuse to do that. I, I, I think I, what did I, I read, I read something in the forward of a book once that said, I'm indebted to everyone who helped me write this book, but any mistakes found are mine and mine alone. Hmm, that's great. I love that. So that's, that's, that's what I think. Give me some other tips that you have to ensure that you don't get overwhelmed with. A choice. So my closet in my bedroom has, has two um, uh, sides. The first side says office and travel, and it has t-shirts and jeans. The second side says speaking and TV, and it has button-down shirts, jackets, and jeans. And that's it. Because, you know, all my suits, my vests, my sweaters, my nice shoes, my Italian belts, those all sit in my daughter's room in her closet. Because if I had to get up every morning, look at my clothes. Okay, what should I wear? Let's see. Oh my God, that sweater. I remember this. Laura <laughs> gave me that sweater. I wonder how Laura's well, doing. I should look her up. It's three hours later. I'm naked in the living room on Facebook and I haven't left the house. <laughs> it could be, and you said most of your clothes, I believe, are uh, gray or black or you know similar colors, <laughs> correct? So you don't have to choose even color. Well, the colors, the colors can be all, all or not. I mean, I have blue, I have gray, I have green. That, that I'm totally fine with. Okay. For me, the issue is really about, um, uh, you know, not so much the, the, the colors, but the actual clothing. I look, I, have, I just, I can reach in. I don't even have to look. Mm -hmm. It's a t-shirt, it's a button-down shirt, whatever, done. There are people who are listening here who, uh, who think, yeah, I, I have ADHD or I think I might and I would like some more. What can I do in my business? Because you have to operate within certain parameters in business. What would you say to them? understand the, the way you can do the best for yourself. So for instance, I, um, uh, I won't go into a meeting without having done, um, without having done a, uh, uh, some form of physical activity, even just something as like running up three or four flights of stairs. Mm -hmm. It is mandatory that I do something first. Now, is that true for all people with ADHD or just sure. that's your, you the know, majority of people with ADHD have a, a, a lack of dopamine, serotonin. And so for me, I'm able to use that, I'm able to gain that back by exercise, by uh, doing uh, something physical that, that, that alters my brain. Mm -hmm. Do you do something right before you go on television or in an interview? Actually, no, because on TV, um, on television, things like that, that get, gets me. I get the dopamine and serotonin I need from that, right? Going on TV, talking to an audience, talking to a crowd, I love that. That gives me everything I want. So yeah, it's really just for, you know, because who the hell wants to be in a meeting? <laughs> <laughs> well, and then the, you, you're seeking out that adrenaline with skydiving, with going on TV. What other things do you do that, that get that adrenaline flowing? Um, a lot of exercise. You know, every morning, like I said, I won't, I, won't, uh, I won't leave the house without having exercise or I won't start my day. So I'll either go to the gym or I have a Peloton bike, which is a, a game changer. Um, things like that. You know, I make sure it's just mandatory. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, I'm also very aware of my sleep and what I eat. I try to eat as healthy as I possibly can. So in our lives, we have typically three to five stories that shape our lives. Can you tell me one of yours that has shaped how you operate in the world as an adult? That's a good question. I think that um, when I left my last, I, like I said, I only had one real job in my life. And when I left that, I remember getting hired to start another one. And two weeks in, uh, the... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there going, wait, I, you know, my first job was America Online, where they basically let us do anything we wanted, work any way we wanted, as long as we got everything done. And then my second job, you know, I'm like, what do you mean we have to check in? What do you, what do you, what do you mean, certain times for lunch? What, what is this, Russia? Right? <laughs> and I remember going out on my own and waking up and saying, you know what? I'm going to start, I'm going to go out on my own and start my own company. And I said, when it fails, not if it fails, when it fails, I'll get a real job. I was so sure that's going to fail. Uh, wow. Now, it's almost 20 years later. So, I, I, you know, don't spend, your, don't waste your time. There's a great quote from a TV show, Archer, where he says, why fill up your brain with some what if, probably won't happen, hypothetical bullshit. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I agree completely. You know, I live, try to live in the moment, live for now. And that's one of the things uh, I know about you is you say yes, you go into things without, um, not without com- complete preparation, but you don't have notes and, because you can speak off the top of your head and you, because your brain is always going faster, right? There is a logic that people think ADHD is a bad thing, but here's the thing. It means you have a faster brain, right? If mm-hmm. I have a faster brain, if I, and let's equate that to a car. If you have a Honda and I have a Lamborghini, as long as I know how to drive that Lamborghini, I am going to drive a lot faster. <laughs> right. So the key is make sure you know how to do that. You've got a Lamborghini. You just have to learn how to drive you know, it. To drive it. Yeah, because if you drive a Lamborghini like you drive a Honda, you're going to crash into a tree. Right. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I love that. Well, Peter, where can people find more information about your book and you? So the book is at FasterThanNormal.com, as is the podcast. Uh, and I am at Shankman.com, and my life is on the socials at Peter Shankman. And I encourage everyone to reach out. I'm more than happy to chat. Fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and working through this so that we can benefit from it. My pleasure. Welcome to Stacy's Journal. In this segment, I let you peek into my journal as I share my thoughts on a topic or resilience resource. I loved Peter's contracts with himself to make sure he does what's right for his brain. I think we can all learn something from that. I know for me, I can't take that first bite of bread or a cookie because I'll eat till I'm beyond full. And I'm also a huge procrastinator, so I have to schedule my time and stick to my commitments for myself in order to get things done. I once heard a business guru recommend we schedule our lives just as if we are in school. When the virtual bell rings, at 9 o'clock you do one thing, at 10 o'clock you do another, and so on. That makes sense, because time definitely fills up what we give it. So I'd like for you to think about contracts that you need to make with yourself. What is it in your life that you overindulge, or avoid, or procrastinate, or need to put parameters around? What contract could you make with yourself that would ensure your success? Find your trigger, then plan a contract with yourself to avoid that trigger. I'd love to know what you planned. You can share with me over on our Facebook page. That's all we have for today. In the last episode, Jeanette White shared her story of resilience through infertility and miscarriage. So if you know of anyone who's been going through or is currently going through this, be sure to share that episode with them. Next week, we'll interview Sharon Roth Lichten, who talks about finding peace and joy in the midst of adversity. I love interacting with our listeners on social media. We're on Pinterest, Facebook, and just about anywhere you can hold a great virtual conversation. Before you go, don't forget to go and register for the upcoming webinar, Four Simple Proven Methods to Writing the First Chapter of Your Life Story in Just Seven Days. Head over to stacybrookman.com slash webinar for that. One more thing. We're having fun counting down the 100 plus most important memoirs of the past 200 years. So our memoir of the day is Night by Elie Wiesel, written in 1956. Awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and Congressional Gold Medal, Holocaust survivor Wiesel offers an unforgettable account of Hitler's horrific reign of terror. The tragic tale unfolds through the eyes of 14-year-old Eliezer with a heart-wrenching inevitability. This enduring classic raises questions of significance for all future generations. How could man commit these horrors? And could such an evil ever be repeated? Check out the book Night and all the memoirs on this list at stacybrookman.com slash 100 memoirs. And always remember, life is a story. It's never too late to start telling yours.